Good afternoon, everyone. That's great. <laughs> I want to talk to you about the future of animals. But before I begin on that, I would like to tell you a little bit about my family. <laughs> so, as you can see, we are two dogs. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so, we are two humans. <laughs> yeah, there are more dogs. So, yeah, we are two humans, seven dogs, one rooster, don't miss him, his name is Mint, and a rabbit. Yeah, and I like to refer to my animals as my kids. Right? So, here is a picture of all of us, as you all have seen. And uh, moving on to the next picture is a picture of my partner attempting to sleep. There is my partner, and this is how we have to sleep. <laughs> so, yes, having nine kids is not easy, right? So, finding a rented home in Mumbai to live, with, live in with so many kids was definitely a task. And uh, eventually, I did manage to find a home on the condition that I don't bring home any more animals. But the good thing was that there was no restriction on the number of birds. So I went ahead and brought home some of the kites that my charity had rescued. These kites required a soft release and uh, some space to recover and become independent once again. So here's a picture of the two kites. Yes, so that is Sultan on the right and Choti on the left. Okay, so Sultan and Choti took some time and eventually became independent and flew away. Even today when I see a kite soaring high in the sky, I eagerly run to my balcony and yell out Sultan's name, hoping that it is him, you know, and he will come down and meet me. And what you absolutely won't believe is that this one time, it was actually Sultan. He came down and he came to meet me. <laughs> okay, so it was one of the most memorable moments of my life. And I gave him some food, he ate that, and then he promptly flew away. I think it was his way of letting me know that uh, he's doing well. And I'm glad that he has gone into his future as a strong bird once again. <laughs> Let us now talk about the future of human and animal welfare. But before I go down that path, I want to know how many of us even believe that the welfare of animals has any serious role to play in our future? Most people think that uh, animal welfare is something like a hobby, which uh, somebody who's an animal lover does simply because they like animals. Honestly speaking, even I am one such individual. I started out by making changes at a very personal level and then gradually taking it to society. Today, I chair a charity for animals called My Pal Club Foundation. And in my experience, all that the rescued animals want is to feel that they belong. They want to feel loved. So how do you put a price tag on this? How do you quantify this love? And that is where viewing this work from a sectoral perspective becomes really important. Animal care and welfare is that sector where human beings love animals unconditionally and without expecting anything in return. Animal care workers try to uphold the five freedoms, which is a globally established standard in animal welfare. The freedoms are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort by providing animals with a comfortable environment, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom to express normal and natural behavior, freedom from fear and distress. However, simply establishing these five freedoms and all is not enough. Most people find it inconvenient to uphold and implement these freedoms. Animal-related issues are social problems of massive size and scale, which impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. And the organizations and individuals trying to tackle these problems 
make up a very tiny portion of the population. We have two sets of rules, one for human beings and one for animals and the rest of the living creatures. Let us take a look at some of the ways through which this discrimination is practiced. Money. The amount of money being spent on animal welfare projects is minuscule. Most people dislike the idea of giving large amounts of money to animal charities simply because in most people's eyes, animal charities do not affect, directly affect human life and well-being, right? Poor infrastructure. In an agrarian economy like India, where animal husbandry contributes to up to 5.2% of the GDP, one would expect good animal healthcare systems in the country. Don't get me wrong, there are government hospitals across the country, but most of them lack proper infrastructure and equipment. Compensation. Less money invested means poor compensation for animal care and welfare workers. Honestly, I have not drawn a proper salary since I started working in this field. And it is not right to expect somebody who wants to do charity work to make such huge sacrifices. Unskilled manpower. Since the infrastructure and compensation are so poor, how can we expect to attract proper talent into this sector? The only course available is in veterinary science. And that too is mainly focused on the meat and the dairy industry. There are no properly structured courses for veterinary technicians, veterinary nurses, or for any job in animal welfare. The supporting sectors of veterinary pharmaceutical and animal food are also not properly regulated. And this results in poor quality products in the market, which means that we have to rely heavily on importing these items. So why is the situation like this? Maybe history will give us an answer. In Hindu mythology, Maharshi Kashyapa plays a major role in the creation of the universe. He married the 13 daughters of Daksha who gave birth to humans, animals, and all living creatures. Amongst them are Aditi, the one I am named after, the mother of gods, Diti, the mother of demons, Surabhi, the mother of Kamadhenu, that is cows, buffaloes, uh, horses, etc. Vinata, the mother of uh, Garuda, the eagle. Kadru, the mother of Nagas and Sarpas. Sharama, the mother of the one of the most loved creatures, dogs and wolves and other canines. And uh, so on it goes. Thus, human beings, demons, gods, animals, and all living creatures became siblings. One of the earliest rescue stories is from Buddhism. Prince Siddhartha was deeply moved by the pain and suffering of the swan that his cousin Devdatta had shot down. Not only did he apply herbs to soothe the aching bird, he also uh, went to the palace court when his cousin laid claim on the life of that animal. The uh, palace sage court, he announced the verdict after listening to both sides of the story that a life belongs to he who tries to save it and not the one trying to destroy it. And the wounded swan, by right, belongs to Prince Siddhartha. Animals have played an important role in the progress of civilization, somehow losing their status as peers and becoming lives who can be used for benefit. From laboratory to space research, animals have been ruthlessly used for the development of mankind. Most of us have heard the name Laika, right? As the first dog who went to space. What we do not know is that she is a stray dog, she was a stray dog from the, uh, from the streets of Moscow, who was sent into space with one meal and a seven day oxygen supply, all the while being heavily restrained. The noises and the pressures of the flight terrified Laika. 
The National Air and Space Museum holds declassified records showing her respiration. Her heartbeat tripled and her breath rate quadrupled. And like I said to have reached the Earth's orbit alive, circled the Earth for about 103 minutes before succumbing to a very painful death. From exotic fur to tasty food, animals have been used to cater to various needs of mankind. From the cockroaches and the frogs, where we learned dissection from, to the elephants chained in the temples of India, animals have sacrificed their all for the benefit of man. But all hope is not lost yet. India has the Animal Welfare Board of India, which looks into various animal-related issues. The Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act was established in 1960. Article 51 AG of the Constitution of India states that it is the fundamental duty of every citizen to have compassion for animals. The Wildlife Protection Act was established in 1972. The Indian Penal Code protects animals under its sections 428, 429, and also through section 377. The Animal Birth Control ABC program was established in 2001 for the humane control of the stray dog population. The CPCSEA is a body which is set up to govern the experimentation and laboratory research done on animals. So, if we have such a strong history and so many laws and bodies to protect animals, why are animals still suffering in our country? Animals are suffering simply because we lack the knowledge and the interest to do something for them. And the belief that animal welfare is somebody else's responsibility and not ours. Now let me tell you why you need to care for animals and take up the responsibility to do more for them. Zoonotic diseases are diseases we humans can get from animals. Most zoonotic diseases are public health issues. And that is why this becomes your problem just as it is mine. More than three crore cattle animals, excluding poultry, were slaughtered in 2020 for meat as per the census in India alone. Roosters and hens are the most abused living creatures on the planet. 2,000 chicken are slaughtered every single minute, which means that 28 lakh birds are killed on a daily basis. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's so uh, disturbing. Sorry, but it's, it's really disturbing because I personally have a rooster whose name is Mint, and I love him so much. So I, I just wanted to share that aspect of it with you. <clears throat> so chicken and poultry farms are given high doses of medicine to make sure that they reach their ideal weight faster. And by consuming this meat, we are opening ourselves to a number of health issues. The shops on the road where meat is sold do not even have a veterinarian to certify the health of the animal or bird before the slaughter. So if you consume this meat and there is an outbreak of, say, swine flu or bird flu or any other zoonotic disease, Loss of human life is inevitable. There are laws in our country for humane trading and slaughter of animals, but convenience, apathy, and cruelty take the place of these laws. The greed to reap higher profits by stuffing chicken who can easily be transported in two vehicles into one becomes the norm. The greed to save money by not investing in proper stunning equipment and practicing open and hygienic slaughter becomes the norm once again. Reports say that COVID-19 began in a live animal market. Patient zero is said to be a fisherwoman from that market who got the disease from some live animal. Now, if proper laws for slaughter 
trade and housing for these live animals was practiced, this would not be the situation in the world today. Companion animals, our favorite animals, because, you know, we <laughs> all have a close bond with them. Companion animals have a very close bond with humans. Unfortunately, even they are not spared of cruelty. The trade of pet animals is a highly unregulated market. Pet animals are sold like over-the-counter products, resulting in thoughtless purchases and abandonment in huge numbers. And most of these abandoned animals cannot even survive by themselves because they cannot fend for themselves on the street. <sighs> Unethical breeding and trade of these animals is practiced widely over adopting animals in need from shelters simply because animals, most people think that these breed animals are status symbols, right? Rescuing animals is my profession and I do this work every single day. When I scrape from the roads the parts of a living animal who has been driven over recklessly, simply because that driver thought that two minutes of his time is more valuable than that animal's life. I am enraged and I wish to seek justice for that animal. When I hold in my hands an animal who has been raped by a cruel human being, I am aghast at what man is capable of to satisfy his carnal desires. When I rescue an animal from a life of pain or from a life of cruelty, I feel their pain and I want to do right by them. But despite all the cruelty, the apathy, the hatred that we show towards animals, why is it that animals still love and trust us unconditionally? I'll tell you why. It's simply because animals have hope. A hope from us. A hope from us to understand them better, see what they need, and do right by them. A hope that they will see a better future because of our actions today. You and I are the biggest hope for an animal. Let us not back down in the face of the magnitude of these issues. Let us question the norm. Let us push governments, judiciary systems, policymakers to do better for animals. Let us make changes at a personal level which can make a difference. Let us persevere and be relentless because remember, that this is not just for them, it is for us too. We must learn to uphold, implement and amend the laws we have in place for animals. We must learn to assess every scenario with the five freedom framework before we conclude that an animal is well and comfortable. We must learn to be compassionate and show compassion to our fellow human beings. This is not a small or easy responsibility, but in Spider-Man's uncle's words, with great power comes great responsibility. Each, each one of us has the ability to see animals as sentient beings. Once you learn to love an animal, you will do it for life. And it is important to understand that by saving one animal, you won't be able to change the world entirely. But you will change the whole world for that one animal. And if each one of us takes conscious actions, by saving one animal at a time, we can and we will save them all. In Mother Teresa's words, you can do what I cannot do. I can do what you cannot do. But together, we can do great things. Thank you.